is going to be a short tutorial on the setup for a spatial filter, as well as uh, some arguments as to why you might want to use spatial filtering in your next projector project. What I've done for this demonstration is installed a Mitsubishi P73 diode into a brass housing. I've used a two millimeter aspheric lens to focus this on a far field screen. I've chosen this diode because it's probably one of the worst beam quality diodes that's frequently used in projectors and benefits the most from spatial filtering. I've taken the beam that comes out of the focusing lens, reflected it off of a steering mirror, and sent it downstream across the room to a large household quality mirror, second surface mirror, and then retro reflected that beam back across the room to a projection screen that's relatively close to me. This, for people who are just beginning the process of building projectors, is a great way for uh, optimizing the setup for any kind of an optical train. And that is, optimize your optics for the distance that you anticipate you'll be using your projector at. But by using retro reflection and a mirror, you're able to do so and still keep the, the final focus within your field of view. So as you're finagling tiny little optics such as knife edges, you can see your fingers at the same time that you can see the effect of the little motions that you make. It's a, it's a great technique and it speeds the alignment process. What I've also done here is I've set up some optical supports to allow me to install the beam correction optics. I should correct myself, beam manipulation optics because what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to change the aspect ratio of this tiny vertical uh, stripe to more of a square aspect uh, by using cylindrical lenses set up in these two holders here. I've got a relatively high uh, power or short focal length negative lens, negative cylinder that I'm going to install first and place it in such a way that when the, actually I should back up just for a second to show you something. I'm not going to edit this. If you look carefully, you'll see that the raw output from the uh, collimation or uh, focusing lens shows some pretty wide wings horizontally and some multi-mode stripes vertically. The diode is not set perfectly within its housing. I'm a little biased, and so as a result, you'll see a little bit more energy up rather than down. If I was very careful and finagled with this diode a little bit more, I could make this aberration symmetrical about this center line but I wouldn't reduce it with the alignment. I would just trade upper for lower, lower for upper, but you can't get rid of it. That's just inherently part of the problems with this diode. What you'll also notice is I took a small piece of tape, I don't know if you can see that on the camera, and I've just attached it to this large screen at a point just about where the diode is projecting at this point, and from this point on, using this tape as a measuring point, you could use pencil lines or markers. Every optical element that I place downstream should not move this image substantially from this point. That's a good way of preventing yourself from uh, creating any off-axis aberrations by misaligning the secondary and tertiary optics. So when I install this lens, as I was about to do before, you'll see that I'll create a much wider stripe with the first element. But it should still be centered about that spot. Now that's not just pure chance, it has to do with the fact that I set up this original spot, this original mount, to hold this lens in the proper position. You'll also notice that if I rotate this cylinder, I can cause the beam in the far field to distort by rotating also. If I started perfectly horizontally, all my cylinders should maintain a horizontal uh, aspect. Whether they distort the beam laterally or, or vertically, they should not create any rotation. It's another reason why I only use uh, circular uh, cylindrical lenses with a circular mechanical format because it allows me to fine tune the alignment of these cylinders so that their axes are perfectly um, corresponding to each other. Uh, frequently people use these rectangular shaped cylinder lenses thinking that the mechanical edge uh, provides a great uh, alignment for these two uh, optical elements. I found both from Edmonds, uh, Thor Labs, uh, the group buy, that the lenses that come uh, mechanically cut often have a little bit of a bias in rotation. So if you set them up assuming that they're going to operate uh, in the same axis, 
you often end up with a slight amount of residual aberration because of misalignment. So by using a completely circular lens and being able to rotate the lenses, you can negate any kind of aberrations caused by rotation. So that's why I do this all the time. Now you see when I put in the second cylinder lens, I'm right now it's completely misaligned. But if I rotate it to take care of the aberration caused by the first cylinder, I can effectively produce a very symmetrical but now reduced size beam. Uh, now all I need to do is change the spacing too far out, too far in, and just about right. And when I have this perfectly, you'll see that the small little wings, the aberrations on the side, become just about as tight as you can make them when the spacing is correct. That's pretty good for the demonstration. I'm just going to lock these two lenses in place so they don't move around. And effectively what you have here is the typical output from most projectors with the beam manipulation objects. I've traded off the narrow stripe in the near field for a now a square beam, if you can see this on my hand. Uh, actually, let me hold my hand a little further down so that you don't have such an angle on the camera. Now I have a nearly rectangular shape on my hand. It may be washed out, but it's no longer a vertical stripe. It's almost perfectly square. This is a great shape for a scanner mirror. And as a result, this also produces a much lower divergence in the horizontal direction. And in fact, that works fairly well for most projectors, except for all of the noise that you see above and below. A lot of people will try to correct this by masking. Uh, they'll take this nearly parallel beam coming out at this point and try to place something in the, in the path to block some of that aberration. The, the mirrors of the scanner itself will provide some vignetting and knock off some of the worst um, uh, uh, wings, the farthest uh, aberrations from the center point. But they don't go very far. As soon as you see me starting to block this, you can see that, yeah, I can knock a little bit of it out. But as soon as I start to really try to get close to the center point, I begin doing a lot of damage to the center point. That's because the the vast majority of the aberration that you see out here, and laterally and horizontal, is not external to the beam that you see in the near field in the projector. It's within the diameter of the beam. It's just going to diverge over a period of time. If I continue to move farther away from the lasers, continue to move down field here, as I move farther and farther down field, you'll find that if I try to block the aberrations now, you can see that I'm more effective. The reason being is most of those aberrations have begun to extend outside the diameter of the main beam, and I can now pick them off. But obviously, unless you want a seven or eight foot long projector, that's not a convenient way to do that. And that's the advantage of spatial filtering. Now, the spatial filter is an added beam component. It adds length to the projector, and that's, that's a downside. But it has two major benefits that you get from the same set of optics, and that's why I always use it. The first benefit is the fact that the chances are that the beam that you've got coming out of your first set of one axis correction is not going to be exactly the right size for the scanner mirrors that you're going to be using to send down stream. You want to fill up all of that glass. You don't want to overfill it because obviously you're going to waste light as it passes the, the mirrors in the scanner. But at the same time, you also don't want to use a, a small fraction of that glass because your 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 Having to tolerate the decreased uh, quality of your beam because of the fact that uh, you've got a, a slower scanner with larger, heavier mirrors. If you're going to have larger, heavier mirrors, you, you should use all of that glass because the larger the beam is here, the better the quality is going to be in the far field. By using these telescopic mirrors, these are, excuse me, telescopic lenses, if they're the same focal length, the beam going in is going to be the same as the beam coming out, no change. But if you make slight variations in the powers of these lenses, let's say 200 millimeter and 100 millimeter, you will effectively change the size in both X and Y of the beam coming out of here, and you can fine tune the final output size of the beam to match the size of your scanner. So my philosophy is use these optics to create the right shape, in this case square. Use these optics in order to create the right size so the square fits the square input from a scanner. 
In this case, what I have is effectively a two to one ratio. So the lens here is a 100 millimeter and a 200 millimeter, and as a result, I've got a two power telescope that's going to improve the quality in the far field by a factor of two. And I'm going to increase the size of the beam in the near field by a factor of two. I'm going to put these two lenses in place, and as you watch, you see where the beam is. When I place these lenses, the first lens is going to go in, and you notice as I move it sideways, I will position it so that once again, it's just about centered on that piece of tape. There's dirt, don't worry about that. All of the, the noise aberrations, uh, dirt, dust, hairs, whatever else is in the optical train prior to the spatial filter will go away. That's one of the nice things about the spatial filter. Everything downstream, you're going to live with. So that's one of the arguments for putting it as far downstream as you can. The second lens that I'm going to mount in here, I'm going to put this into position. And you'll notice, because I've used these small fiduciary blocks, I'm not going to have to bore you with a lot of alignment. If I position this correctly, I've got the now narrower beam, again, centered on the piece of tape. And so, as a result, this beam is about half the size as it originally was. And I've got the two lenses lined up here, creating between them a very bright focal point, about halfway, or in this case, about one-third of the way downstream between these two lenses. At that point, you reproduce in an identity the aberrations that are present here. Every aberration that you see here is present here at about a 1 20th or 1 30th scale. So what I do is I place a small block. In this case, it's a small aluminum block in which I bored holes and glued in some um, rare earth magnets, very powerful magnets, that are just shy of the front surface, which has been ground to a matte, nice, smooth surface. And it's this surface that I'm going to use to mount the blades, as you can see, the razor blades, that are going to form the spatial filter. What I've done ahead of time is I've mounted this block so that I'm going to put this at the correct position. But what you'll find is as you slide the spatial filter back and forth, you'll reach an optimal point where any slice across the beam will in fact cause a very sharp, crisp edge to come in as the spatial filter is lined up. If you're before the filter, it never, uh, excuse me, before the focus, it never seems to work quite as well as being a little after the focus or at the focus. I find a little after seems to always work a little bit better. When you're very close, you will actually have such a magnification, even on these very high quality razor blade edges, you'll see burrs and defects magnified in the far field. When you see a lot of contrast and a lot of defects, you're at a good spot, that's where you want to be. Now I'm just going to position this so that it's centered in the small hole that I have in the middle that completely clears the beam. Lock it down, and then using these magnets, I'm going to slide these razor blades into position. The first layer of razor blades are held so tightly that when I place the second set of razor blades against here, you're going to find that the first set don't slide. So it's kind of an elegant setup you don't have to do a lot of precise alignment. But if you see me coming in from the top, you'll notice that the effect on the far field is going to be from the bottom. As a consequence, that means I'm past the focal point. And you can see me sliding in. This is done by hand. There's no precision pinholes, no microscope lenses, just simple 100 and 200 millimeter lenses. And I bring the light right into the edge there. I'll just remove this piece of tape because it's creating a little bit of a false sense. Then I'm going to do the same thing from the top, or excuse me, from the bottom. Put the microscope, uh, put the razor blade down here, and just slide it in. And as I do, you'll see that the aberration in the top of the far field also disappear. Now you see a little light appearing above there. That's actually just light bouncing off the back side of the razor blade, and you can take care of that very conveniently, as I'll show you in just a second. Now I'm going to slide in from the side. Again, it should come from the opposite side that I'm moving this in because we're past focus. And you'll be able to bring it in to the point where you can't see that little spot lying lateral. And once again, I'm going to do the same thing from the other side. And as you can see, I can move these around and it's not having any effect on the underlying razor blade. It's a really neat technique. Bring this in. And then finally, that little bit of extra reflection that you see from the top 
can simply be blocked by putting a little razor blade or even a card because the intensity is low using the magnets above. That's the quality of the beam that you get using spatial filtering. So with this set of optics here that I've already shown you and the interposed uh, mask that can be hand fit with these razor blades, I've added a little bit of length to the beam and what you can do is you can set up your projector where in fact instead of reflecting everything to the front of the projector on the two modules that use this, the red and the blue, I actually will reflect the beams or take the module output and send it away from the front of the box and wrap it around the sides of the uh, module giving me the extra beam length that I need in order to fit it within the projector. So increased resolution or quality of beam because you maximally utilize the surface area of your scanner mirrors and uh, minimal scatter around the beams producing a far higher quality beam in the distance. This is a far more effective use of uh, optics, I believe, than trying to fight to find just the very best lens for the collimation. Uh, whether you use a two millimeter or four millimeter aspheric lens, you're gonna see very small differences in the quality of the beam. But when you use a spatial filter, you can clean up blue and red diodes to the point that it looks nearly like a, an ion or a helium neon laser beam. So that's my tutorial. Hope it was useful. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. Bye.